Hey everyone, Jamie here, just dropping in to let you know that this episode is going to look a little bit different than the typical episode. Last month, I went to the Society for Neuroscience Conference, which is the largest neuroscience conference in the world. And I interviewed researchers from all over the world who were presenting posters at this conference on their research. This episode is the first in a series of episodes I'm going to be releasing on the channel called SFN Shorts. Um, and it consists of a few of the interviews that I had with, with some of these neuroscience researchers. Uh, these SFN Shorts will be released weekly throughout the month of December and potentially the first week or two of January. So I hope you enjoy and without further ado, here is SFN Shorts. <laughs> I'm here at the Society for Neuroscience Conference, or SFN, in Washington, D.C. And right now, I am walking through a massive hall where hundreds of graduate students and postdocs are presenting posters on their scientific research. So what I am here to do is I'm going to be talking to those graduate students and postdocs about the research that they are presenting on their poster, um, get them to give a five minute or so presentation, and then ask them a few questions about their research and I will be compiling those interviews into an episode or maybe a couple of episodes uh, called SFN Shorts that will feature a lot of the research that is going on here at the Society for Neuroscience. In this first interview, I spoke with Nicholas Cottom, a graduate student at Delaware State University, about his research into a mouse model of a genetic condition called spinal muscular atrophy and basically the similarities and differences between the mouse model of spinal muscular atrophy and the actual disease seen in humans. So if you could first uh, introduce yourself. Sure, my name is Nicholas Cottom. I'm a PhD student at Delaware State University. I'm in my fourth year and I work with spinal muscular atrophy. All right, uh, can you tell me a little bit about your poster? Sure, so uh, in this study, a sort of side project study in our lab, we wanted to look at the sex-specific vulnerabilities in the Espen Delta 7 mouse model. It's a very common mouse model used in spinal muscular atrophy research. And can you quickly just give a background of like what spinal muscular atrophy sure. is? Spinal muscular atrophy is a neurodegenerative disease. Um, it's a lot like ALS, but different genes involved in uh, different pathologies and things like that. So patients will experience motor neuron, spinal cord motor neuron degeneration, and that results in muscle atrophy and uh, uh, locomotor in in inability, essentially. And um, yeah. Is this something that happens in adulthood or childhood? Or? This, is, this is a, a genetic disease and it affects children mostly. Okay. It's actually the leading, uh, one of the leading genetic causes of infant mortality. So um, you don't know a lot of people with SMA. Right. Unfortunately. So, so then it's really important to kind of understand what's going on then. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so that's uh, in the clinical data recently. Uh, my PI, Dr. Jen Lee Sun, has noticed uh, a trend that males were slightly more, uh, had slightly higher incidence ratios, so more likely to have SMA. Okay. And that their progression of the disease was slightly more severe. Okay. Um, and this could be related to many things. Um, there's some X linked. Uh, uh, mitochondrial factors and oxidative stress management factors that could help combat, but um, it's really hard to pinpoint these sorts of things, of course. Yeah. So um, we're just on the ground level trying to document what's going on. Okay. So looking at this mouse model, a uh, study hasn't been done of this sort in this mouse model for about uh, 15 years. So we wanted to update it as well as add some uh, th this incidence aspect. Okay, so, to see if there is a sex difference. Right, right. So what we did was we tracked 20, 23 litters uh, over about eight months to a year um, and kept track of how many SMA males and how many SMA females were, were born in these litters. The incidence ratio was not significantly different across males and females. And for each, uh, each pup in every litter, we did locomotor testing and some phenotypic assessments like brain weight, body weight, survival. Uh, we did some common SMA tests like writing reflex and negative geotaxis. Um, so starting with the, the brain and body weight were not significantly different and the survival was all, periods were also not significantly different. In other words, the lifespan. Uh, however, we did see that the females are slightly smaller at younger ages. This could have something to do with the X-related, uh, X-linked immune, immune factors or X-linked metabolic factors that might be changing weight. But another thing that's really hard to pinpoint is just speculation. 
Uh, then for the motor test, starting with the riding reflex, that's where we put them on their back for five seconds. Okay. Uh, and then let go, start the timer, and they flip over. And we keep track of how long it takes them to flip over. Uh, the SMA mice usually are unable to do this or, or struggle to and it takes them longer time. So we took those values at uh, two day intervals starting from P6 until the death of the last SMA pup in the litter, uh, which was about P16 or P18. Uh, we noticed no significant difference at any age point across male and female. So they both, both performed about the same? Yeah, yeah, and their, their likelihood to failure was also about the same. Okay. Also looking at the negative geotaxis test, we put them on an in, uh, inclined plane. Uh, we put them face down and the mice will have a natural inclination to turn around uh, just because it feels safer to them. So it's like a four limb uh, coordination action that they have to be able to do. Uh, and these SMA pups tend to be not so great at it and they fail a lot of the time. Um, so looking at the time to success and the time to failure, not significantly different across male and female. And then, uh, we compared the no attempts to attempt ratio. So how likely were they to not even try to turn around? Okay. And this did happen a significant amount of times. Uh, and we looked at the success to failure ratio. So whether they... Whether they yeah, were yeah. able to turn around or not. Yeah, yeah it's pretty self-explanatory. And sometimes it would fall off the plane, but we kept it close to the bottom. So it, was a, it wasn't a long fall. Everything was padded, of course. So um, we saw no significant differences, at least nothing convincing. Right. Looking at the data here, there's a slight trend that the females were less likely to attempt and uh, more likely to fail. Okay. Uh, you, if you're looking at the data, you can see that there's really not a uh, not a lot of significance. Right, and not a clear trend. Either. Not a clear trend, just just a little bit like uh, in the attempt stuff, but uh, nothing that we wanted to hang our hat on. Felt right. like we felt like the stronger conclusion was that there was no significant sex differences. So uh, in conclusion, looking at uh, this mouse model, which is really commonly used in the SMA field, comparing it to humans is not always, um, it's not, not perfectly mimicking what we're seeing in humans. So that's something to consider yeah. trying to make conclusions. Also on the flip side, the good news is that uh, labs that do study the phenotypes in these mouse models don't have to worry about controlling for sex because um, right. this study proves that it's not necessary. Right, so I was gonna ask like what, kind of implications does this have for like how well this mouse model translates over to the human disease? Yeah, definitely. I mean, it says a lot about the genetics and that something is at play there uh, yeah. for, you know, what's contributing to the sex specific <clears throat> vulnerability that we see in humans. Yeah. So is this mutation, so these mice are, are mutated so that they um, have a mutation in this gene. Is this the same mutation you see in humans? Yes, okay. it's actually the same gene. So okay. the uh, humans have two copies of SMN, two types, and mice have one. We take out the one and give them the one that doesn't really work from humans. And then the Delta-7, which is like a backup so that they actually survive long right. enough so to be able to study. study yeah, exactly. Okay, so that is, that is like a one-to-one, -one, because I know sometimes you make mouse models of like Alzheimer's and it's so multifactorial that you're like, you know, it's a deletion or a mutation in this gene, but sometimes in people, like you don't even see that mutation in that yeah, gene. So this one is kind of actually more of a one-to-one. -one with. Yeah, yeah. And you see in like uh, a lot of Parkinson's research just on the other side of this wall, yeah. a lot of people use um, PFF to induce Parkinsonian symptoms. Right. So they don't, the mice don't actually genetically uh, have Parkinson's in the form that we think of it in humans, but they have Parkinsonian, yeah, yeah. yeah. So there, those are the factors you're talking about where it really complicates your conclusions on yeah. going across species, yeah. Well, thank you so much for telling me about this. No problem, yeah, thank you, appreciate yeah. it. In this interview, I spoke to Dr. Asuzu Johnson of Witts University about her research into diabetes alcoholism and how both of these conditions affect the brain and specifically the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that is responsible for making decisions and taking complex actions. So can you quickly introduce yourself? Okay, so um, I'm Dr. Asuzu Johnson from Witts University in Johannesburg. Nice to meet you. So we're looking at the effects of alcohol on diabetes. So we know it reduces the volume, it re um, affects cognition and learning. We've looked at it in the hippocampus, but now we decided to look at it in a frontal lobe. 
Now the frontal lobe helps us make decisions, right? So when we looked at the frontal lobe, we found out that alcohol affects the cortex of the frontal lobe, reducing the fibers that actually leave the frontal lobe um, to make connections with other areas. So we're expecting to see an increased effect with alcohol combined with diabetes, but it didn't appear so. So we looked at the layers. Instead of looking at the entire cortex, we broke it down into layers. Okay. So we found out that in alcohol affects only layer six, increasing the glial cells there. But diabetes plus alcohol increased the glial cells in layer six, five, four, and one. They increased the, the increased the glial cells. The neurons are decreasing, but the glial oh. cells are like the support cells. Okay. Those are increasing. Okay. So we looked at qPCR that tells us what's happening with the genes. Okay. Now the genes make the proteins and the proteins make the effects, the function that we see. So we found out that the genes in the diabetes plus alcohol, the protective genes that help it repair are actually increased in diabetes plus alcohol. Um, however, the genes that are also inducing cell death, the cells to die, are also increased. So you have both protection and destruction of cells occurring at the same time. So now we extrapolated that the cell's death genes are causing the neurons to die, okay. but the cell protective genes are actually protecting the glial cells. Okay. So that's why they are increasing rather than decreasing. So they're protecting those cells. In the cerebellum, we also looked at the same thing. We found out that decreasing fibers that are leaving the cerebellum but we now have uh, also a decrease in Purkinje cell induced by alcohol. Um, and then we have a decrease, both for diabetes and diabetes and alcohol, we have a reduction of granular cells. And these are the intermediate cells that sit between um, the cortex and the white matter. Okay. So now these are where you find excitatory and inhibitory cells both excitation and inhibition are reduced with diabetes okay. and diabetes and alcohol. So this has sparked up a new field, a new concentration for our studies, where we're not just focusing on the size and the number of neurons, or even the neurons themselves. Rather, we're looking at the projections and the plasticity. Basically, the outside cellular um, cells that are involved in making connections for important functions such as decision, executive function, and learning. Right. And to understand how like diabetes and alcohol consumption affects like all of those larger processes. Those larger processes, yeah. So it's not the individual neurons, but the neurons' ability to make connections with different areas. And most times they're not able to do it on their own. They rely on this nursing cells yeah. that are around them. All of the surrounding cells that there are more of, but the neurons are still dying. Exactly. So have you done the, the qPCR that's looking at the genes? Have you done that? specifically looking at what genes are being uh, expressed in the glial cells versus the neurons? That's where, that's where we concentrate in on now. So we're going okay. to target specifically, not just look at the processes like cell death, right. but actually look at the specific functional genes like myelination and, and synaptobrevin. Those are the ones that enable the genes to make transmissions to each other. So we're focusing on those genes rather than just cell death. And was this, so was this um, using post-mortem like human? No, no, so this way use this was rats. Rats, 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 oh, I saw that, okay. Yeah, <laughs> so it's a subchronic study. Um, we actually use a model where it's self-induced alcohol okay. intake, so the rats are given alcohol ad libitum, okay. so they consume as much as they want, just mimicking the adult lifestyle consumption of alcohol but for a subchronic period of three months. Okay, and then how do you make them diabetic? 
<laughs> okay, so we also try to use a human pathogenesis model where we use lifestyle factors like their feeding. So we increase caloric intake in their feeding and then we alter their pancreas also, the okay. beta cells, just to mimic the genetic factor in human diabetes also, okay. where there's an alteration in insulin um, production and then complement it with lifestyle factors such as caloric intake. Okay. So we've been successful in that with males, not females. That's why we use male rats only for now. Why, why do you think that is that there's that, um, so the females you like can't induce a diabetes type phenotype? It's not uniform. So okay. sometimes you have sporadic different effects. And so we're still looking at the hormonal control because with diabetes induction, the hormones, especially with the ovaries and estrogen, have a lot to do with if diabetes is maintained. So sometimes you induce diabetes, but after a couple of weeks, the rats are not diabetic and then they return to being diabetic. Yeah, so we're still working on that model for females, yeah. Yeah, that's really interesting. And I assume like, you know, other studies into those models could really um, shed light on how uh, there are, like, I assume there are some sex differences in diabetes in people. Yes. And so then like that model maybe could then shed light on how like sex hormones and, and other sort of factors impact diabetes in like men versus women. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. That, that, that's something that's something we need to get right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> this is really cool research. Um, thank you for telling me. Thank you so much. In this interview, I spoke to Allison Reed, an undergraduate at High Point University about her research on Delta-8 THC, the main psychoactive component of cannabis, and whether or not it can protect neurons against oxidative stress. First, can you uh, introduce yourself? Uh, my name is Allison Reed. Yeah, nice to meet you. And um, he said you're an undergraduate at High Point? I am. I'm a junior. Excellent. Yeah, so can you tell me um, about your research? Yeah, so we were looking into Delta-8 and its antioxidant effects that it's known to have. And we did that with our um, cell line here, the SHSHY cells. And we particularly did that in a hydrogen peroxide injury. And so we did that at two different concentrations, a 400 and a 125. So basically just a severe, really strong one and more of a moderate, weaker one. And across the board, we found that whether we had 50 or 500 um, concentration of that Delta-8, the cell survival stayed relatively the same, especially compared to when no um, Delta-8 was used. So basically it's not gonna provide any neuroprotection or protect those cells from cell, de uh, from cell death, but it's also not making those injuries worse. So if you have a stroke and you have weed in your system, it's not gonna like kill off more cells basically. And speaking of strokes, kind of our future aims, we did a glucose deprivation um, within the cell media. And again, really similar trends, um, the cell uh, survival stayed the same. However, we want to look into that with the oxygen deprivation chamber. So basically take all the oxygen out with the lack of glucose, fully replicate a stroke and see if any more of those cells survive. Okay. Yeah. So this is, you're doing this in um, neurons that are basically growing on a plate. Yep. They're um, neuroblastoma. Okay. And then you're putting on um, hydrogen peroxide. Correct. Uh, and then are they treated with cannabis or like the Delta-8 THC before? The they go on at the same time. Okay. Okay. And same with the different medias. Have you considered um, whether a pretreatment would have more of an effect? Because I assume like if you're concerned about people having um, THC on board, like when some kind of injury occurs, then like, have you considered seeing if pretreatment yes. uh, with THC effects? We have looked into doing that. And I actually think there's a couple people in my lab that might be doing that. Okay. Is that, yeah. Okay. Have they seen anything different? Okay, so he, he said not with Delta-9. We've also, I did a little bit with Delta-9 and the results were really similar in terms of cell survival. Okay. So right now it's really looking like whether you apply it before, apply it after in terms of order of injury and treatment, the results are saying pretty much the same, which it's not gonna kill off the cells, but it's also not gonna help them survive. There, so it, the, the introduction sets that there's some um, studies that are suggesting that uh, THC might have an antioxidant effect, but you're seeing that it doesn't really make the injury any better. Do you have any like hypotheses as to why you might not be seeing that effect? 
I think it might just not be sh like a strong enough antioxidant. Okay. Or our hydrogen peroxide injury is too strong. Okay. So it's just, it is just completely wiping out any effects yeah. that the- Because yeah. hydrogen peroxide is just in general, a really strong injury for cells to take. So yeah. that's yeah. kind of my hypothesis on that. And then are these concentrations of the THC kind of similar to what you would see if a person were say like smoking? They're actually a little higher okay. than, so um, yeah. So even more than what you would physiologically get from using weed. Thank you so much for Thank going you. through that. For this interview, I spoke with Tara Barnes and Anna Stremsky, both undergraduates at St. Mary's College of Maryland, about their research on woodpeckers as a model organism for chronic head trauma. Hi, um, thank you for agreeing to being recorded. Um, can you each introduce yourselves? Sure, uh, my name is Tara Barnes. I'm an undergrad at St. Mary's College, Maryland. My name is Anna Strumsky, and I'm also an undergrad at St. Mary's College of Maryland. Great, and so can you walk me through some of your research? Sure, um, so we did some exploratory work looking at um, tau isoform ratios um, with qPCR, and then looking at difference in the tau phosphorylation using IHC. Um, what we found is that the downy woodpeckers displayed um, localized phosphorylation in only two regions of the brain, the cerebellar and the striatum. With previous re re research, it suggested that we would see a lot more of the phosphatal in the woodpecker. However, we saw less and more in the tufted tip mouse. Um, this led us to further investigate like what else is going on with this bird because they have 70 million years of evolutionary adaptations to hitting their head. So, you know, there's something there. Um, and my colleague Anna looked into doing qPCR. And can you quickly explain what qPCR is before you launch into it? <laughs> so a qPCR is where we want to amplify a gene. And in this case, the Q stands for quantification. So we're looking for the relative quantity of these different isoforms. The way that works is the machine amplifies the gene over and over again until it reaches a certain threshold. We know the relative quantity based on when they reach that threshold, and it will take a different amount of cycles depending on the amount that is there to begin with. So we use this qPCR to measure the ratios because they are relevant to pathology in humans. Woodpeckers, however, in addition to the 3R and 4R that humans have, have what's called 5R. 5R of what? I'm sorry. <laughs> so that's five repeats. So okay. in the C terminal of the gene that codes for tau, okay. there are these binding repeats and that's where it binds onto a microtubule. Okay. So this is a gene that's like, um, if you can just kind of explain why you're interested in tau. So we're interested in tau because we're really, we're, we're interested in CTE, which is a tau pathy, meaning the pathology is related to the tau protein and isoforms are one of the things that could have an effect on this in addition to the phosphorylation. And so CTE, that's like, um, it's a, the, it stands for chronic traumatic encephalopathy I'm seeing. So is that like kind of a concussion or like what kind of causes that? So it's associated with recurrent subconcussive forces. Okay, so kind of like what football players get. Yes, exactly. It's very common with football players, okay. boxers, and other rough contact sports like that. Okay, and then this tau protein is kind of associated with, with that like disease? Yes, so specifically, we're concerned about tau accumulations. Okay. And we call these neurofibrillary tangles. Okay. And so then, um, why were you interested in using like birds as as your uh, models for looking at the tau proteins? So woodpeckers in particular experience a lot of force on their heads. After 70 million years of evolution, we'd expect they'd have some kind of neuroprotective properties that would keep them from dying and getting you know, various diseases from that repeated stress. <laughs> yeah. And so, um, sort of, she started out talking about the different patterns of this phosphorylated tau protein in the woodpecker versus the titmouse. And so what do you think is the significance of those different patterns and like, what can that tell us about human tau accumulation in people who get a lot of chronic head injury? So that's something we need to look more into. Okay. Right now, we're mainly concerned with figuring out what is there. And so like, what are the immediate next steps of, of this research then? 
So right now it's preliminary data and our next step is to expand on it, especially with the tau isoforms, we want a bigger sample population so that we can make statistical conclusions. Thank you. Thank you. In the last interview for this first episode of SFN Shorts, I spoke with Dr. Yuriani Rodriguez, a postdoctoral researcher at the University of Miami, about her research into taste receptors and uh, non-canonical ways that um, taste buds can sense sweet taste. All right, so can you introduce yourself? <laughs> okay, my name is Yuriani Rodriguez. The title of the poster is P. alphabeta to independent detection of glucose in gustatory afferent neurons. And the main reason about the poster yeah. is about the sweet detection. Okay. And we know that test detection is possible through the sensor detector that like are the test bot. And in the inside of the test box, you can find a type 2 cell. We are going for we are gonna focus in the type 2 cell because these cells are the cell which detects SWIC. We know there exists a canonical pathway with when the SWIC is present, the test receptor recognize this SWIC and activate a pathway. Okay. In this pathway, the PSA beta 2 a protein is involved. And at the end of this pathway, you can see there are a release of a neuron transmitter to communicate with the afferent fiber and go uh, send the signal to the brain uh, to transmit the, the signal. To, we 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 wondering in this world is we eliminate this canonical pathway, is the mice are still able to detect SWIC because exists another no canonical pathway that another lab also a proposed that maybe the SWIC can be detecting using a no canonical pathway. Okay, so not using that taste receptor that you just discussed. Exactly. To do that, we use a knockout mice to PSA beta 2 knockout mice because if we eliminate this PSA beta 2, we eliminate the canonical pathway. Okay. And also this mice express the GCAN3 uh, calcium reporter in the geniculum ganglion because the test box are in the oral cavity and the idea is to stimulate this test box coming uh, in the oral cavity through the a catheter. We release here the sweet stimuli and at the same time we're recording in the geniculum ganglion the neural activity. Okay, so you can see directly whether or not the sweet activates those cells even if they don't have the canonical pathway. Exactly, exactly. Okay. We use homozygous and we also use the heterozygous as a control, you know, because they did express the PSA beta 2. Okay, first in the in this panel, we uh, evaluate the morphology in the knockout mice, the test both the, the type 2 cell morphology in the different in the test box coming from the knockout mice and the heterozygous mice. And you can see here there are no difference between in the morphology. This is a, a cell from the heterozygous that express PSA beta 2. And this is a cell which doesn't express PSA beta 2. We use a different marker from the type 2 cell. And you still see that the morphology is very similar. Doesn't affect the morphology of the test bud. That's important so that it's not, the effects you're seeing aren't because the taste bud looks totally different. Exactly, yeah. exactly. And or, or, or it's viable. Yeah. And also because we do the functional recording because we are evaluating, the main experiment is in the, in the geniculum ganglion. Because it's fluorescent, you can see in the YX here, the DF over F. And here we put in blue the knockout mice and in gray the heterozygous mice. And we here in the two first stimulation in citric acid and sodium chloride, you can see that these two, two compounds are detecting using a different pathway. We know for sure the citric acid and sodium chloride doesn't need this canonical pathway to, to be detected because also it's detecting in different cells. You, we use like a, a positive control and we can see how there are no difference between the heterozygous and the homozygous. But when we check in the homozygous, uh, we stimulate with sucrose and bitter, you can see really responses of this compound in the homozygous, you see? And the heterozygous response. That I, as we expect. So, oh, then we, we wonder, okay, this, if we increase the concentration and the uh, timing of the stimulation, we can see responses. Okay. And we 
when we use a high concentration, because here we in the sucrose, the sweet was 300 millimolar, here we start using one molar and from sucrose and a different compound. That's very sweet. <laughs> yeah, it's very sweet. And you can see we did see responses in this um, uh, knockout mice from okay. sweet. And also when we increase the timing from to 30 seconds, also we found more uh, cell responding in the knockout mice. Um, there's one also to more sweetener. Okay. And we think that these responses in these knockout mice are coming from a independent pathway we go, because we know for sure these mice doesn't have the canonical pathway. And also we have evidence that the heterozygote mice also have these cells that only respond to high concentration and long duration. That means when we eliminate this canonical pathway, we can detect sweet responses coming from an independent test receptor PSA beta 2 pathway. Okay, so then it needs to be a much higher concentration to activate the other pathway, like much stronger sweet. Yeah. Have you done staining for the protein that you knocked out in the canonical pathway to like confirm that it was a complete knockout? Like, is it possible that some of these responses are coming because there's, uh, or in, in here, in the sucrose, are coming because there's still just a tiny amount of the taste receptor left that didn't get knocked out? Okay, we don't evaluate the PL beta 2 in this in this cell, but we use the marker. The, the other marker, 3.5, is the same it's detecting the type 2 cell. Well, yes. we, don't, we don't do that, but the, I need to check because this animal that this Arnoka we, we are using from, they was created from Jane here, okay. the 2019, and they, they also have behavior experiment with these mice, they, and they say that these mice uh, did not recognize this. They don't have pre any preference from sweet. Okay, so they so that paper kind of confirms the knockout mouse. Exactly. Okay, got you. Okay, and so what's kind of like the future directions for this research that you're interested in? Because these, there are different proposals. For example, there are, a, a, for example, Margoski, this is, he has a, a paper when we propose that one of the mechanisms to detect sweet is to do using a sodium glucose co-transporter one. But the only uh, thing about this explanation and the, you only can explain the glucose, you cannot explain about the other kind of sweetener. Oh, gotcha. And we think that maybe exists another protein and other sugar transport, I don't know, we need to figure out what is the mechanism. And right. we, this is the, the, the next direction, to figure out the mechanism to detect using this can no canonical password. Okay, yeah, that's really interesting. And so I don't know if you've uh, looked into this, but I had been reading about like when people lose their taste with COVID, they say they can still taste like salty. Um, and some people have hypothesized that that's because there's like actually salt transporters. So could this have applications with like, say could you overexpress a sugar transporter and like reintroduce sweet taste for someone who had lost like sweet taste through the other pathway. Can be interesting, I think. Yeah, it can be very interesting. And also, you know, the the test book are renewed every two weeks, no? And also, the it's different. The COVID is different. Thank you so much for going through your research. That was great. Thank you. No, thank you to coming. Bye. Thank you all for listening to this first episode of SFN Shorts. The posters that were referenced during each of these interviews will be available on the website at inplainenglishpod.org. The second episode of SFN Shorts will be posted next week on Tuesday, December 12th. Our music is by Sam Brunwasser. You can find more of his work at soundcloud.com slash visualsnowbeats. As always, you can download the paper and read the transcriptions at inplainenglishpod.org. And make sure to follow us on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram at Plain English Sci. That's P-L-A-I-N-E-N-G-L-I-S-H-S-C-I. Thanks again for listening, and we'll see you next time for another episode of In Plain English. Okay.